My guest today is Kevin Gates. Kevin, how are you? You know, David, I'm wonderful. It's uh, end of the year, and so yeah. that's a wonderful time to reflect and think about like the new version of me for 2024, but it's <laughs> been a really good year. You know, you do a great job of capturing the old version of you and the other folks <laughs> as well through your photography. I, I'm, I'm a photographer myself, and I just I find that it's a great way of preserving memories in ways that maybe the inside of my brain <laughs> sometimes cannot. Yes. And it's a wonderful gift too, because you and I can capture photos and give those away and, and capture yes. those moments that other people may not be able to capture in the moment themselves. Absolutely. Let's talk about photography. I want to just, uh, I mean, this shows technology and friends. So we, <laughs> let's focus a lot on the technology because there's a lot of, the, the thing I like about photography, it's a combination of left brain, right brain, right? It's creativity, and it's technical know-how. It's art and it's science combined together. But uh, tell me a little bit about some of the the ways that you think about photography as a computer scientist. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, it's, uh, I would just say photography is something that I stumbled into because it started with, you know, buying my first digital camera and just like going on trips. And then all of a sudden I started to develop a passion and uh, it's a little bit of what you talked about, which is being able to capture a perspective that you otherwise wouldn't be able to see necessarily with your own eye. Uh, and so that's how I think about photography is I, I see a scene and I first think about what that would look like as a picture and what angle, what perspective. And then from there, I'm trying to get the camera, the technology to help me capture what I actually see in my head. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm really dependent on the technology being responsive or at least me knowing, you know, what presets I have on the camera, what angle might work best. Uh, so I can quickly go from here's what I see in my mind to the technology helps me execute that shot. Okay. Uh, wh what do you think about before you even take the picture? What's what goes into the decision making process? You know, uh, I tried to pull together a list of just interesting things that I think about in a somewhat fictitious scenario, because there's things that you can do for um, an event that you're going to, where you have time to prep, you might want to look at the space, but there's other times where it's very um, ad hoc, it might just be with your phone. And so I've got some tips that I thought would be worth uh, sharing. Um, for folks that would like to see and they can pause the video, I talk a little bit about myself here and just some of my passions, uh, including my family and dogs, which all make wonderful subjects, by the way, to take pictures of. <laughs> especially especially with little the, guys. Yes, Maurice. Uh, and then I just got a new Sony camera. And so I'm always, I always look at the, the pictures I take first with a new camera and it's always shots around the house and, and with yeah. family. Um, and then I publish a lot of my photography on my website, Dread Don't Die. Um, and so I, I'll show examples of that as we go throughout uh, the discussion today. Um, but you asked about prep, and I think that's really important because there are really interesting ways we can use technology today, David, to get familiar with the space. And that could be just looking at pictures online or even just doing a virtual walkthrough where you can actually walk through a restaurant, a venue, and actually see some of those perspectives on your own before you even get there. And to me, that's a, a really cool thing you can do. Oh, I see you got a section here on, on your gear. What, what kind of camera uh, do you have? You have more than one, but what's your camera of choice? So my primary camera is a Sony A7R5. So I just got this one uh, for my birthday and for Christmas. My birthday was yesterday. Um, and so- Happy birthday. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but yes, this is a, a camera that uh, I have the three and the four, but this one uh, features AI. And so oh. it has human and subject detection. Um, and the thing that I like is Sony has always done a really good job with eye detection, but what this camera can do now is see and recognize objects from all different angles. And so if this bird, you know, here we're seeing a side profile of the bird. And so it's able to recognize that bird lock into the eye um, here we see a side profile of someone, but then even here, that uh, object recognition sees a dog, but it sees the back of the head, but it locks in the focus on the head so that when that dog turns, it's ready to lock that focus right on the eye. Okay, so if it assumes if there's a uh, an animal or a person 
that the point of interest will be that person or animal's face, and it's smart enough to recognize what the face of a dog or a human being looks like. Exactly. Yeah, and it's really interesting, right? We hear about chat GPT, large language models, all of this stuff all the time now. Yeah. And now there is this, you know, this model running on the camera that is there to help me identify and think in advance what shot do I want to take and to line it up so I can quickly go from here's what I see in my mind to locking in focus directly on that dog's eye. That's fascinating. You know, one of my observations about photography is that uh, this camera on my phone, I happen to have an iPhone, I think it's a 14. Um, yeah. the, the advancements on this camera have been just phenomenal in terms of the, how, how much they've accelerated. The, every two years, we've got a major advance in the phone cameras. But that same velocity hasn't happened in the SLRs, the digital SLRs, the the, the professional or the pro-am cameras, at least that's my perception. But this is sort of bringing some of the technology, there's some AI technology built into my iPhone and to an Android into this camera, which has way better optics. Exactly. Yeah. And there are areas where the phone is really strong because here, if we keep looking down the list of my gear, you know, uh, we, we have different lenses that I have, but you will see that an iPhone 15 is still something that I make heavy use of because the ability to pull the phone out for it to recognize the faces exposed for everyone that's in the scene and the lighting. I can do it with a big, you know, Sony camera, but a lot of times it's harder and I need to set up lights. Um, and so right. to your point, right, the best camera is the one that you have with you. And so even when I'm taking shots with my big camera, I will pull out my phone and do what I call safety shots with right. my phone just to make sure that I'm getting uh, just some different perspectives. And yeah, the, the size of it makes a difference, too. I, I do a lot of bike riding and it's nice to have this in my pocket. It's hard to carry a, a big camera around on a bike. Yes. Yes. But uh, although I noticed that the camera, can you scroll up to the picture of your camera? That looks sure. a lot smaller than mine. Is this a, this is a mirrorless camera, I assume, right? It is mirrorless camera. Tell, tell um, me a little about that technology. I'm just, I'm just learning about that now. Yes. So the idea with a mirrorless camera, uh, and I'm not, I'm going to give you the, the 100, 200 level, but it does not have a mirror that reflects the image up into the viewfinder. And so there is a, a really a digital aspect that's happening where the light is coming in hitting the sensor and then it's giving you that image directly on the electronic viewfinder um, so what that ultimately means is a smaller body a uh, smaller size and you still have a lot of the digital benefits of, of capturing images in a digital format oh, very cool this is uh, i'm my camera's 10 years old i'm in the market for a new one and uh, although I have Canon lenses, so I think I need to stick with that. I yeah, I know you're a Canon guy, but uh, if I could get you on Team Sony, David, I would. Yeah, I, I would totally, totally would do if it. I would. Uh, I don't. I don't want to throw away my lenses. <laughs> of course, yes, and that's the one reason to stay on uh, on Canon for sure. Yeah. Um, David, the other thing I wanted to mention is a, a website called uh, Lens Rentals, um, okay. because I have gear that I own here, but you can also rent gear and so if you want to if someone wants to try uh, a technology a camera or something like that uh, before they buy you can go to lensrental.com uh, other websites do rentals but i think that's a really good tip because it helped me play and try with uh try different lenses and cameras before i actually committed and, and invested oh, nice. in i'm looking at that right now try for seven days it looks like most of the rentals are for seven days which seems ideal um, oh, so you've talked about the setup, and what about when you're uh, uh, taking the photograph? There's a lot of technical aspects to that as well. Yes, there is. Uh, one of the things that I use is, you know, I talked about the uh, eye detection that works um, to, to capture images. I am the type of person, um, I get the question from folks, if I'm a new photographer, like what's the best way of, of setting up the camera? And one of the things that I do is to put the camera in aperture priority mode. Um, what does that and mean? So that is basically the, I should have had my, uh, my Sony camera here, but that is the dial on the camera that tells it to basically uh, ex sets the camera up to focus, um, to primarily focus on what it is that you're shooting. So for example, if it's taking a picture of my face, my face will be sharp here, the background will be blurred. Um, 
but it lets you really understand the fundamentals of photography just by working with focus first. And then as you start to work with focus more, you can see how if you change focus, you lose light. So then you need to add light and adjust some of the different angles of, uh, of that camera system. Uh, you talked about the um, having your face in focus and the background blurred, the, the, this depth of field concept. Talk a little about how that relates to the aperture. Yes. Uh, so I this is one of my tips that I generally give around photography, which is, you know, when people think of a, a shot that looks professional, it is usually seeing something that is in focus and then seeing blur behind. Uh, and there's two ways of doing that. Usually one is by having a camera that has a very shallow depth of field or a very, uh, lets in a lot of light. So for example, the camera I'm on now is a F 1.4. Um, now what does that mean? F 1.4. So that indicates how much light the camera is able to take in. So how wide the aperture, the iris of the camera opens so that it can take in the maximum amount of light. Okay. Um, and so, I can either get a blurry background by using a lens or by distance. And here I'm actually doing both. My lens can focus sharply on my face and blur the background, but my background is also far away from me. And so because I'm separated from my background and I have a, a lens that uh, is doing the separation as well, it gives me a lot of depth in the scene here. Yeah, nice. In a way that my camera does not do. I don't, I don't have the capability of mine. Yeah, harder to do in software, but <laughs> the combination of separating the person from the background and uh, the optics helps. It does. It makes uh, in this example here, it makes your face stand out more. People will focus, uh, focus mentally on your face because the camera is focusing physically and blurring everything else. Yes. Um, and so I've got some other tips, David, that I think. Uh, work well for for folks. And like I said, some of these work for, you know, if you've got a big Sony camera or any kind of camera, others work even just with your smartphone. And for me, the number one thing is to clean your lens. Yeah. And so this was a picture that I took with my uh, iPhone 15. The one on the left was just me grabbing it out my pocket and taking a picture of the camera. And the other one was after I wiped the lens. Uh -huh. You can see the difference. Um, and so literally anytime I take a shot anywhere, I'm grabbing my phone, I'm, I'm first wiping the lens. It's, it's very instinctual. Oh, really? Okay. So you, uh, essentially every time you take your camera out, you're cleaning the lens. Correct. Yeah. And just to get the grime or fingerprints off and it really does enhance and uh, improve your I shot. Should, I should get in that habit. I haven't been doing that. I clean it when I notice it's smudged. Yep. Um, another thing that can improve uh, your pictures, and I know this is a show about tech, but there is some low tech aspects to this, just mm -hmm. like with anything. Sure, uh, left brain, right brain. Yes, uh, the other is facing the light. And so in this example here, you can see I'm taking a picture of a classic Zoom. So I've got a white uh, Zoom still in my collection over here. Nice. Um, and you can see the window is behind the Zoom and I'm trying to take a picture and focus on the Zoom but what you see is all the light from the window is, what I try to explain is, it's like photo bombing the picture. It's <laughs> screaming over the shoulder of the zoom and it's trying, the light from the window is not letting your camera focus on the light bouncing off the zoom itself. Yeah. And what I did here is I turned the zoom slightly um, to face the window and now we can see the quality of the picture I get is much better because the subject, the zoom is reflecting the light from the window into the camera. Yeah, that's a hard thing to fix in post processing is if you don't have enough light to begin with, you can't really add the details that light provides. Yes. Yeah. Um, we talked, David, about background separation. This is the basement uh, area that I am down here. Um, one of the things I like to do when taking a picture is, you know, instead of grabbing my son, if we're out at a uh, game or something and putting him next to a wall to take the picture is to stand him out from the wall and maybe have the background behind him, right? Be something far away yeah. so that it gives that depth of field that you can see here. Awesome. Got to focus that smile. Um, and then I've got some other tips here, taking pictures at subject or eye level. I think that really helps tell the story when you're trying to take a, or 
relay emotion through a, uh, a photo, especially when it's someone who's little, getting down to their level and, and showing their perspective. I recently read a tip. This is a low tech tip that if you need to take a picture of something close to the ground with your phone, turn the phone upside down. Hey, that's a good idea. That right down here. I never really thought about that before. And then uh, sometimes the camera will just automatically flip it. But if not, it's you can edit two after. seconds to flip yeah. the phone over. And that saves wear and tear of my back. <laughs> <laughs> and also yes. you can literally get it right on the ground if you want to. Yes. You know, no. That's whereas if it's if it's straight up and down, then the farthest you can close you can get is is this far. <laughs> yes. And here, I'm going to grab my camera. This is my uh, other Sony camera. But to your point, David, this kind of screen here, you can see the back of the screen uh -huh. uh, tilts out, and so okay. that's another thing that I use on the cameras if I want to get a shot lower down or getting that subject or eye level. I'm relying on the technology here to allow me to lower the camera far oh, enough. Oh, I see. So you can look I at can it from still, above. And I can still look at it from above. Nice. And so technology is, is helping me in that sense as well. Uh, let's see. The other thing, you know, David, I would say from a technology and blending of um, photography is how cameras are able to take in dark scenes and light scenes all at the same time. If, hmm. if we take for granted with our eye, the ability to, you know, look in a room and see everything in the room. But if there's a window open and the sun is out, you can still see everything yeah. outside as well. But a camera has a harder time adjusting to both of those extreme lighting scenarios. Hmm. But technology has really advanced significantly over the years where here I'm looking up which is one of my favorite techniques. And uh, this is a few years ago in the fall and it's able to capture the darkness of the trees, but then the, the blue and the, um, the brightness of the sky. Nice. It's a beautiful shot. Thank you. It's one of my favorite ones. Um, and then I would point to another piece of technology, which is um, the ability to do panoramas right from your phone. So David, mm -hmm. you mentioned, and we talked a little bit about phones and the, the power of technology there. Um, this picture that you see here is taken, taken on an iPhone in 2019. So this I've was seen that this photo blown up to room size and it still <laughs> looks great. Yes. It's impressive that it was a phone that took this. I would never even to this day believe it, but uh, yeah, iPhone, I think it was the iPhone 10. Um, at North Avenue Beach in Chicago. And, you know, again, the, the ease of the phone to nail this panorama shot. I did take like 10 of them and this was the best one. But um, technology can really help you make some. Yeah, this is a good example shots. of the, the phone cameras advanced to do panoramas really well. Whereas uh, I don't think that the digital SLRs have been doing that. I, when I, I, I used to do panoramas, I would stitch them together. I would take eight shots and then in software, I'd find some software that would stitch them together. Yep. Now it's, it's just a button on my phone. Yeah. And I still, I'll still try to do it with my, uh, my Sony and, and take the shots, but then I'll still right afterwards, grab my, my iPhone and <laughs> get the same shot yep. and have the result in a few seconds. Mm -hmm. Um, and then David, a few years ago, I was late to the, the drone train, but a few <laughs> years ago I oh, bought nice. a drone and let me tell you, the technology that now exists so that I can put a camera in the sky oh, yeah. to me has been absolutely amazing. Um, so different perspectives, different ranges, travel, um, the storytelling that you can do with wow. a camera in the sky to me is um, one of the greatest things. Very nice. So you've got your photographs. And um, you're not done, though. There, there's things that you do after the photo is taken, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So once I have like a whole collection of, of pictures, uh, it's time to edit. And I happen to be on a Mac. So I have an M1, uh, which is great for horsepower and going through these pictures because the, the Sony camera that I have creates about 80 megabyte uh, photos. And so if I go out and take pictures, I'm usually coming back with 15 to 2000 photos. And so uh, it's a lot of horsepower needed to get through that. 
Um, and then I use disk light, space too. a lot of disk space as well. Fortunately, uh, because of the cloud uh, and Lightroom, I'm able to import all those pictures into Lightroom and then Lightroom will sync it to the cloud and then delete the local copies off of my disk so that um, I just have thumbnails and then it, it downloads the full full version when I export the picture. So big fan of Lightroom there. And then um, there's a process of going through images called culling. Um, I rarely call it that, but um, there is a whole process, right? When I come back and I have a thousand pictures, like how do I go from a thousand pictures down to a, a very small amount that I share? Um, and I have a process for that, David. Do you have a process that you go through when you're editing pictures? Uh, that's usually the first thing I do uh, is um, I'll go through and I'll just delete the obviously bad ones. Step one. That's good. Yeah. And uh, and then I tend to edit the ones that are decent. I don't uh, I don't call as much as maybe I, I ought to because I should point out that I'm months behind on editing my photo. And that's part of the problem. It's really time consuming to, you know, if I take a, a hundred photos at a concert. Yes. Just the process of the time it takes to edit a hundred photos, even just cropping and adjusting the light is, uh, I've, I've lost that spare time. It is about twice the time once again that I, I see of, you know, editing to the, the ratio of the shots that you're taking. Mm. What, what's your process? You know, so my process is to first go through. So if I import and I have a thousand pictures, I'll first go through and I go by photo by photo and I look at the picture and if it looks good or has potential, then I will flag it. I will mark it as a favorite okay. and I will go through and go through all of the pictures and mark each one. That's a good shot. And if you think about how you're taking pictures, you might see someone, right? You'll take like five or six shots and then move to a different angle, take five or six shots. And so I'll, regardless of how many pictures match in that single shot, I will mark them. And then once I get through all 1,000 pictures, I will then look at only the pictures that I uh, favorited or marked. And those are the ones that you actually will edit. Not exactly, because then I'll go and look at which one. I may have pictures from the same scene that I marked as favorites. Oh, and so you don't need to edit both of them. Correct. And so then it helps me say, well, which shot is better then, right? I was taking a picture of David at this one angle. I marked mm -hmm. both of these shots as good. Which one is the better shot? The one where I'm and smiling, of course. Yes. And then, I, <laughs> and, but that helps me a lot. Give me some options in terms of like which picture truly looks the best. Um, yeah. And so then I'll go through all the, so let's say if there's a thousand pictures, I mark 50 as favorites, and then I'll go through those 50 and then whittle those down generally to maybe something like 40. And then those will be the pictures that I actually edit down. Oh, nice. Um, and we'll tell me a little bit about the editing process. What are, what are you trying to change in the photograph? You know, um, there's a few things that I think about. One is just composition. Um, it's hard to describe, but to me, it's like how the picture feels, like how does it fill the frame? Um, so here you can see like this is a picture of a praying mantis. Uh, it was a much wider shot, but I wanted to edit it down so that it, you know, they call it like rule of thirds or the golden rules and different ratios, but there's a certain perspective and feel that I want the picture to have. Yeah. So the uh, so the praying mantis one, the rule of thirds says that I see that the the head is the the focus of this, and it's about a third of the way from the top and about a third of the way from the left. But you violated that rule in the picture right below that. <laughs> you centered. The yes. Subject. Yep. Yeah. So it's not a hard and fast rule. It's not dogma. No. Correct. Um, and the other thing I I'm particular about are straight lines. So here you can see even when I took this picture, uh, you know. I, the camera wasn't angled up or down. It, I angle it straight because I'm very particular about the lines in the picture being completely straight. Hmm. So that was to your question, David, of what are, what am I editing? It's, it's that it's color. Um, so I'm adjusting the color and then for some of the pictures, I'll pick some out and add a little special treatment or effect to it. 
Um, this is a picture of my son with a bag of chips. Um, and there was probably 20 or 30 pictures from this one um, trip. But this one I thought was really interesting. And I um, used a, an app on iPhone called Color Splash to, um, to draw the color back into the nice. bag of chips. And you're sharing these somewhere, right? I am. Uh, and so I post these on my website, Dread Don't Die. I built this site uh, for over 20 years and I host it on Azure. Um, and I never mentioned this, by the way, but all the blue that we see here in the notes are ways that uh, AI is being used in my editing process, um, even oh. with noise reduction, image detection, things like that. What does that um, mean, noise reduction? Noise reduction. So if you take a picture and it looks grainy, um, and I should have put a, a, an example of a grainy picture, but if you take a picture and it looks grainy, you can put it through the um, Lightroom has it natively in where it will go and use AI to improve the quality of the picture and remove some of that grain and um, really use AI to, to improve it. So if it sees water and there's grain in the water, then it will tune how it repairs that the water a little bit differently from how it might repair a suitcase that has some grain in it. I see. All right. And, uh, so are you just uploading images to your website or are you using some sort of a, a framework to display them nicely? So I upload my pictures to a storage account in Azure and then my custom site um, pool connects to my blob storage account and then displays the pictures. However, I'm using a service that helps me with rendering of the images and it's called ImageX. Um, and ImageX allows me to basically point this, I can point this service to my Azure storage account. And then I call ImageX and ask it to give me certain sizes. Um, okay. And so it will rescale the picture. For thumbnails, you mean? Correct. So it can do thumbnails. Uh, as I mentioned, the photos that I take are about 80 something megs. But on my site, when it renders, it is scaling it down. So if I do a quick scroll here, we can see it for each of these uh, images you see. This is just a thumbnail scaled down from ImageX. So I call ImageX, I give it some parameters in the URL to say, give me this image at this ratio 16 by nine, um, do some improvement to the image. It will also find the face. So if it's a tall picture, it will find the face and zoom in on that. Um, so that makes it a lot easier for me to, to have these very large files. All right. Hey, we're just about at time. Uh, I know you've been doing this for decades now, but there's a lot of people that want to get more involved. Where, where do people go to learn more about becoming a better photographer? You know, I would recommend YouTube because I'm, I'm very visual. Uh, and so I've, I follow channels like Adorama on YouTube, uh, Tony and Chelsea Northrup, but there's just a wide range of, of channels that will teach you about photography, do how to tutorials, give you links to the gear. Um, so I would highly recommend checking out the, the wide, vast community on YouTube. Awesome. Well, Kevin, thank you so much. This has been really educational. I've been taking photos for years, for decades, and I learned something today. Yes. And uh, it's, it's great to see how technology continues to, to bleed into the world of technology and, and the fuel new passion and new possibilities, too. <music>